You heard the saying, it's made round to go round. It tends to go round me quite a lot. <laughs> you probably know the feeling only too well. This is the oldest coin in the world. Uh, the fine print, for those in the back row. The oldest coin in the world, a one-sixth of a stator. It's made from a metal called electrum, which is a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver. The coin originated in the area near the Aegean Sea on the Turkish side, and its date is about 600 BC. Out of the passage that Steve's just read, there's a few things that we're going to pick up. The first of them is, hmm, it's hard to pick out, isn't it? Who is this person that I am becoming? We'll skip the fine print. Have a look in the rearview mirror. Some researchers asked thousands of adults a question. Look back 10 years or so and think, how have your values or your attitudes or even your personality changed in that 10-year period? You know, just as a little exercise, can you do that now? You think, am I a different person now? than I was 10 years ago? Probably are. No, there's no problem about it. You definitely are. Now, can you look ahead 10 years? Can you imagine what your attitudes and values and personality is going to be like in 10 years' time? That's much harder, isn't it? Trying to, to look ahead. Uh, researchers have called this the end of history illusion. You know, I can't imagine that it gets better than this. Or in some cases, I can't imagine it gets worse than this. Uh, it's hard to pick what the future is going to look like. Let's focus on how did I get to be the way that I am now? Look at the, the crowd that turn up. You've got, first of all, the chief priest, the teacher of the law, the elders, the Pharisees, the Herodians. How did they get into those positions? Now, it probably was, look, if they're, they're priests, they were born into that role. They were the Levites. They, they had been trained up from before they could even crawl that they would have this role. It's, it's been inculcated into them from birth that they are God's chosen special people, that they would represent the people to God and God to the people. What an awesome responsibility. The teachers of the Lord, these are those who loved God's word with a passion. They threw themselves into the scripture. They memorized it. They dedicated themselves to it. The elders, those who had the wisdom to lead the people, the Pharisees who had dedicated their lives to study and to teach and the well, let's just pass over the Herodians. They're a bit of a bad lot of them. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just politicians. <laughs> but for the others, here they are hating Jesus, standing against God's plan. That's not how it began. They started out, didn't they, with such high hopes, with such faithful dedication to love God and his word, but... Somehow, something got in the way. Something unwittingly has turned them around. What a, what a tragedy for those who, who began with such enthusiasm. And so when we meet them here, they're living in fear. They're afraid of the people. They fear people more than they fear God. And someone comes up to upset their world and all they're trying to try is we've got to catch this guy out. What went wrong? That's not how they began, is it? And what about for us? We start out with such high hopes for our marriage, for our careers, for our parenting and wow, things just get in the way all the time. And I'm being pulled by so many factors and all of them are, are helpful factors. 
the things I've learned and experienced in my past, my family, friends and colleagues. You know, even the obnoxious people can be useful people if we learn the lessons. You, your significant others. We're, we're unaware of it, but our national culture, uh, the habits we have, they're unconscious. That's why they're habits. What I desire and want, how I perceive things, my personality, my emotions, and of course, my bent to sin takes me, drags me down. What have we got to do about that? Well, every day, every moment of every day, I've got, to, I must deliberately choose this new path, not the path that others are trying to drag me down. I've got to find God's path. Otherwise, I will end up just like these people who were opposing Jesus. It's not how it began, but how it could end. This direction determines destination. Just imagine that we're all going on a holiday to Tahiti. Anyone with me on this? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? <laughs> So we turn up to the airport with tickets for Tahiti. High hopes here. And there's a plane. Let's climb on. Now there's a crowd of us. We'll, we'll just... We're on the plane. And uh, just before we taxi out onto the runway, the captain comes on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, joining us today on our flight to Perth. Uh, now, if you're Jean and you would like to go to Perth as a family, that's fine. But for the rest of us... Hang on, weren't we heading for Tahiti? The direction that we're going, the direction we hoped we were going, turned out to be the very opposite direction. This is how these people turned up to Jesus. They started out gloriously tuned into God, but ended up heading the wrong way. And so instead of getting in a fist, fist fight with them, Jesus exercises what he usually does. You know what that is? We see it right through his ministry. Every time he bumps into people. Now, you never hear of him punching anybody's lights out? If it was me, well, <laughs> woo! But look at Jesus. He saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because he saw them for what they really were. Not as his opponents, not as those who just wanted something from him, but for those who were harassed and helpless. They were just like sheep without a shepherd. Look around. The people who annoy the socks off you are just harassed and helpless. They are sheep without a shepherd. That's their real problem. So how do we respond to them? Not by bopping them on the nose, but as Jesus would do again and again and again and again. He has compassion on them. And just in case you missed it, he's modelled it for us, we get this. It comes as a command. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ. God forgave you. Ever met someone who didn't need forgiveness? Ever been in a situation where you didn't need forgiveness? Come and live with me every day. I've got to say sorry again. <laughs> so it's the trend of your life that determines the end of your life. You don't get it right all the time. None of us do. And that's what makes us such a great church. We're willing to give some flexibility to each other, to forgive one another. Yeah, we'll get it wrong. We will get it wrong again and again. But we are to be, as we've been singing, gracious to one another and set the direction of our life, to, to head off in the right direction in spite of... The yeah, you know, we wander off the road periodically. Every day, you'll come to paths where you need to choose which direction am I going to take, 
and whatever direction it is you'll come to another fork in the road there's always decisions to be made maybe this is a better way to do it <laughs> to, to set the road in fact you are doing it whether you realise it or not you are setting the road for others to follow no matter who you are or where you are you are a trailblazer and all the more so because you're following Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith how do we do this is just one of the many examples uh, remember our studies in Ephesians wasn't all that long ago put off your old self and instead be made new in the where do you start the attitude of your minds but don't let it stay just inside your head put on who you now truly are in Christ a new creation in Christ created to be whoa not just better looking not just clever but created to be like God himself in true righteousness and holiness that's a pretty high standard that is where we're going that's the direction of our life in spite of the people who are around us look at the trend of your life here's the the number of people who come to Christ uh, and the age where they accepted Christ and it's pretty amazing let's just do a little um, head count uh, those who accepted made a commitment to Christ as a preschooler age 0 to 4 zero, 1 those who came to Christ uh, ages 5 to 14 quite a good number age 15 to 30 even more. You know, look, you're an odd lot. You don't fit the graph. <laughs> Proof. Age 30 plus when you came to Christ. Yep. A few of those too. We need to get in early because the trend of our life determines the end of it. But hang on. Where are all of these people? It's too easy to get sidetracked to start out with such high hopes of knowing and loving all that God has done for us but to get misdirected by all the stuff that gets in the way people, events, circumstances, the world, the flesh and the devil it's all out there pushing us, pushing us off the path it's grace that we need and it's grace that we need to give to others. Never look down on anyone. You're never, in, you're never high enough up the tree to look down on anybody. But instead, look back with forgiveness. Look forward with hope. Look around, as Jesus did. And most importantly, look up with thanksgiving because that's the thing that's going to change everything else to fill our hearts with thanksgiving will make a difference in every other area of our lives. So let's come on to the, the middle little section of our text today. What are the questions that I am asking? Asking myself, asking God, asking others. What are the questions that I'm asking? Well, here in this little section we get three questions that are asked. The first question is a head question. Is it right to pay tax to Caesar or not? It's a good academic exercise. You can think of the pros and the cons of doing that. Uh, we, can think, we can update it to today. Is it right to pay taxes to the ATO? The politicians are just going to get their hands on it and look at what they're doing. Is it right? it's oh, a very interesting question well, that's why religion and politics are often um, taboo subjects so it's a head question the second question that gets asked 
is a hand question. Should we actually do it? What are the practicalities? When, it, when push comes to shove, it doesn't matter what you think in your head. What do you actually end up doing? That's a hand question. The third question is interesting because now it's a question that's asked by Jesus. And that changes everything because it was a heart question. It wasn't just about what's the right thing to do and what are the practicalities, but it comes down to why are you asking these questions? Why has your life ended up spinning around and heading off in the wrong direction? How come you're in this position when you started out going such a different direction with your life? What went wrong somewhere in the process? The why is a really important question because once you understand why something is happening, then all the other stuff, the how and the when and the which way, becomes a whole lot easier. But Jesus wasn't interested in just the head stuff or what you do. He's getting down to the, hang on, why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is it happening to you? Why did you end up in this position when it was such a surprise? And the answer that they gave to Jesus' question is... Yep, that's exactly what they said. <laughs> they, somehow they got so off track that they didn't even want to answer a question like, why am I doing this? And people are going to come at you with herds of questions. Um, and you know the sort of questions. And, and sometimes they're a bit frightening. Who made God? Where did Cain get his wife? Why doesn't God stop all the wars and suffering? And there's lots of questions. They're hard questions. You Maybe you didn't notice, but now you will because the handout sheet that you've got, the questions on the back, they often ask, how would you answer someone who said? Even though you, you didn't pick it at the time, it's how do we answer the tough questions for life? Now, <coughs> the answer that you give doesn't really matter very much when you're asked one of these questions because the people asking them 99.9% .9 of the time have no interest in what the answer is. All they want to do is show that you know as little about the Bible as they do. It's just an attempt to drag you down, to share ignorance rather than to go on a journey of discovery to know what God is doing. So don't get too hung up on whether or not you can answer the particular question that they throw at you on any one day. Let's have a look at this instead because this is probably a bit more helpful and does set a good direction for us. Now, notice that it's not a happy situation when you get thrown the curly questions. Uh, things like suffer, threats, it's frightening, they're malicious. It's not a good place to be. How do you deal with someone who turns up in the way that these people turned up to Jesus? Well, there's four things to do. And the first of them is this. Start not by answering the question, but start even before the question gets asked. And where do you start? In your own heart. The place to begin is where God himself needs to be in charge, where Jesus is Lord over me. And when I've got my heart right, then the other stuff will begin to flow on more readily. In your hearts, revere Christ, not as teacher, as saviour, but as Lord, your Lord. You're going to follow him no matter what, even when the questions get tough. The second thing we do is always be prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's within you. Now, this is actually going to be a bit of hard work. 
it's not just oh I love Jesus and Jesus loves me though that may well be the best answer you can give but get ready to answer the question know with such passion that Jesus and me are like this and out of that that might be your answer but if, if you're wrestling with a question then it can be the preparation that you need and that's why Wednesday 7.30 everyone's welcome a good time to come and iron sharpening iron make the sparks fly not only do we need to be prepared but when it comes to the delivery how's it supposed to happen but do it actually do it open your big mouth and don't worry so much about what mess comes out and you, you don't have to be an academic you just have to say this is how I see things do it with gentleness and with respect because they will hear that more than they hear your words don't worry so much about the words your attitude will carry far far more weight 10 times 20 times 100 times more weight than your words ever will and you know it and then back it up don't let them have more ammunition to say the church is full of hypocrites everyone's invited uh, <coughs> back it up with some good behaviour some righteous behaviour remember we're called to put on God-likeness, righteousness, holiness and then finally Whose is the image that I am bearing? And remember they turned up with the coin and Jesus asked, whose image is on it? Let me look at it. They brought the coin. Whose image is on this? And whose inscription? No brainer. It had Caesar plastered all over it. This is what the coin actually looked like. It's just like this. It had Caesar's face on one side uh, and the inscriptions on, on the back it says uh, Pontifex Maximus High Priest that this was one of the problems Caesar their high priest well, he was no Levite he was no righteous or godly man uh, should they even be handling something that said like, uh, like this and um, the writing up the top is the uh, the way that their um, dollars and cents worked in those days. What are we doing? Hands up. Anyone remember um, handling pounds, shillings and pence? <laughs> oh, a few. And <laughs> yeah. we think, oh, they get it so easy these days, <laughs> only dollars and cents. Um, just, just for the young ones here, how many pennies in a shilling? So soon we forget <laughs> 12 pennies in a shilling. How many shillings in a pound? Well, you knew that one. Yeah, to get to the bigger numbers and it starts to get a whole lot easier. What was it? When there was something really expensive like a, a lounge, it was advertised in guineas. What was a guinea? Yes, a pound and a shilling. Oh, they were the good old days, weren't they? Yeah, it, makes, it, it makes um, you know, dollars and cents a whole lot easier. All right, now, you know, we digress. Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. Okay. It's his money. It's got his name on it. If you write your name on it, you're making it your own. The money had his name on it. It was his. No trouble giving it back to him. Should we pay taxes? Yeah. It's got um, Australia printed on it. doesn't have my name printed on it. <laughs> send it. Send it back. The Australian Tax Office. Um, and it's got the Queen on the other side. Interesting enough, she doesn't pay tax. She <laughs> How can you tax yourself after all? Then don't miss the other half of what Jesus said. There was give back... To God what is God's when God has got his name written on it it belongs to him 
just imagine just imagine if they instead of a coin they brought a person and Jesus asked whose image is on this person imagine if Jesus got you to stand up and said to them whose image is in this person looking at you let's go way back Genesis chapter 1 doesn't go any further back than that page 1 God said to himself within the Trinity let us make man in our image in our likeness and go straight on and so that's what happened so God created mankind in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female created them you are made in the image of God God has stamped his own likeness on your life because God is creator that's why you're so creative God is Lord that's why you're able to take responsibility and do stuff he is love that's why we are loving he is the saviour you'll never be a saviour but that's why you can be so helpful he's a judge that's why you're discerning his faithful which makes you trustworthy he is a trinity which makes you relational he's wise which is why you can be so teachable we are made like him not him but his image imprinted onto who we are but there are other voices that are turning us away don't be like that be something else and so while God's voice calms the world, the flesh and the devil are calling us to be obsessive God comforts but all around us we're being dragged into worry he convicts us but the world is what condemns us he encourages unlike the world he enlightens us whereas you'll find confusion outside him he leads us on he draws us he calls us the world is pushing us in the wrong direction he reassures us of his grace and all that that brings where the world frightens us and he brings a quiet stillness into our lives that tranquility that the world cannot know more than that not only do you have the image but you were bought by Jesus himself don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you have received from God you are not your own you've been bought with a price the highest price that the world could know beyond what the world could imagine it's the death of Jesus therefore honour God with what has been purchased by God he owns you and so we're to be in the world without being of the world but we are sent out to the world to make a difference to the world into which we're about to return and how do you do it? you cannot improve the world if you are conformed to the world how can you make a difference if you are not different? we're to be different to be transformed by the renewing of our minds Romans 12.1 so let's not conform to what's all around us be different in order to make a difference so Jesus said to them give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and the little words are always so important and to God what is God's so we are to be good citizens of our nation of our world and keep on giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar to give back to the world what is part of the world we are part of the world we can give to the world we can make a difference to the world and we must never neglect the more important one to keep on giving ourselves back to God because he owns us through and through so wherever we go in the world whatever we do 
we are bearing his image and the shadow of the cross hangs over us. We are to walk that path. And they were amazed. And if we are different from the world, if we polish up the image of God in us, we are a bright shiny penny. We will be noticed We may not be appreciated, we may not be valued, but we will make a difference wherever we go. (coughs) We're made to go around, to go around being good and to go around doing good. Got it? Got it. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, we started out coming to you with such high hopes of who we could become of what we could do of the difference that we could make but somehow something got in the way and it's so easy to not even notice that we're being pushed and shoved and turned around and we end up pointing the wrong direction Lord we don't want that hear our cry, hear our hearts, that we would follow after you, follow hard after you to find your footsteps, to find your direction for our lives and to be close to you, to have you reach out and for us to take your hand, that we would walk with you graciously, slowly, deliberately every step along life's journey. Thank you for what you've done for us and what you are now doing in us. Lord, give us the courage to say no to the other voices. Give us the courage to say yes, yes to you. Yes, he is. Yes, this is who I truly am in my heart of hearts. And then to boldly step out in your direction. And Lord, save us from ourselves. Bless us with yourself that we might live to make a difference in our part of the world, for Jesus' sake. Amen.